Let's kick it! Hi, my name is Robin LaCrosse. I'm with the HPD Education Project, Kicking It with Dorit. Robin LaCrosse is a holistic health practitioner who specializes in women's reproductive health. She has been teaching natural birth control methods for over 25 years because she is passionate about making sure every young woman grows up knowing and understanding her body and cycle. Robin is on a mission to reduce unintended pregnancies and the spread of STDs in the world by changing the way mothers talk to their children about growing up, sex, and staying safe. Robin is the founder of the HPV Education Project to raise awareness about the virus, new advances in HPV testing, and holistic methods of promoting cervical health. Armed with a holistic approach, coupled with the latest advances in technology, she is empowering individuals to protect themselves against HPV. And now I would like to welcome to the show, Robin LaCrosse. Welcome to the show, Robin. Thank you, Jerry. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Yes, me too. This is a great topic. It's something that um, in the 70 or so episodes that we've had here that we haven't had anyone talk about. We haven't had anyone come on and talk about STDs at all. And so um, this is definitely an appropriate topic for women everywhere for not only their health and well-being, but also just for educational purposes. Because unfortunately, some of us when we grew up, you know, really weren't taught very much about our bodies and we weren't taught to appreciate them, to explore them, to know them. So I'm glad that you're here because we're going to be hitting on all of those topics today. Wonderful. And you know, I mean, it's still the, so many children today are raised with inadequate information around their bodies, around their sexuality. And, you know, when you make a choice or with your body around sex in particular, those you know, there can be repercussions that last your whole lifetime, whether it's an unintended pregnancy or a sexually transmitted disease or virus that you get to keep for your life. You know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of important conversations to be had around these topics. Yeah. And I think that it starts with whether it comes from your family or just yourself and your own values, just kind of trying to remove the shame by understanding that all women have to deal with this. All of us have our own thoughts about our bodies and we might not be so happy or so proud to, you know, know more about them. I mean, everyone knows that what happens when you get your period and you begin menstruation and that whole cycle begins, but sometimes people don't go to the doctor enough or they don't ask the right questions. Maybe they might be ashamed to talk to, you know, their mothers or trusted females that are older, that have more experience with this type of thing. So I'm glad you're able to demystify this whole thing because our our vaginal health and our cervical health is very important and it affects not just us, but how we feel about ourselves. And, um, you know, if we have children, there's even further repercussions through the generations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we are not talking about like our bodies and, you know, what's normal. It's like, we don't actually know what's normal. And so we might think that, you know, what's happening to us is unusual or abnormal. And we might feel ashamed because like, as soon as you're potty trained, it's like the whole conversation below the belt stops, (laughs) you know, it's like, and it's, it's unfortunate because there's so much, you know, it's like, if you don't have like the words and the language to, you know, put to your body parts, it's like when you're having like a concern, it's like, you don't know how to talk about it. You know, there's shame because it's like this part of you doesn't even have a name, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like we just like, if we were able to like include that portion of our body, you know, from like when you're children, you know, like learning the, the correct terminology, you know, this kind of stuff and just have it be part of the ongoing conversation, then it won't feel so weird when it comes time to talk about our vaginal health or, you know, what's going on for us mm-hmm. you know, on that deeply personal level. So I've got a young teenage daughter. She is about to be 14. And, um, you know, we've had all of those different talks and Sometimes it's kind of funny because when I talk to her about things, I don't use, I personally, as a mom, I don't use little cutesy names for anatomy. So I don't say, oh, this is your little box or this is your little purse. I use the real names and words for our anatomy. 
And yeah, um, and I think that that's, that's helpful to her, even though she's like, oh, mommy, oh, don't say that, you know, but I want her to be exposed to it. So it's not a shock to her if, you know, she encounters something somewhere else. And I understand that some parents maybe are not as free or as vocal as I am, but there are so many girls and boys that are abused in our country every day that are molested and abused. And part of the reason why is because of that shame and they don't feel like you said, Robin, that they have a voice and that they're not encouraged to know themselves and protect themselves and realize that this belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you. Yeah. And, you know, the whole sexual abuse thing, you know, I mean, this is something that, you know, we can start having that conversation with when our children are very young, you know, the the proper touching boundaries, this kind of thing by giving proper terminology, you know, it's like you give children the vocabulary to express, you know, if something's going on and something that's really important is you want your messages there first, because if you haven't spoken to your child about sexual abuse, the abuser is going to be putting messages in your kid's mind. Like, this is our secret. You know, this is our special little thing. It's like, you know, we don't talk about this. And those messages are going to overrule yours when you come in after the fact, or if you suspect something is going on, the message, oh, we don't talk about this is going to be way stronger than you going in there and asking questions. And so it's really important to have your messages there first, because if something happens, you know, your child then knows, oh, this is not right. And I can go talk to my mom because I know that it's going to be okay for me to express what's going on and she's going to protect me. It just changes the whole situation. You know, even if something happens, it's like your child has the tools to get help and it's going to prevent any kind of long-term damage because sexual abuse, especially the sexual abuse that goes on for years is very damaging to Mm -hmm. children. Yes. And that's what we're here to do is educate everyone and give them the tools and, you know, the resources to be able to get ahead of this because prevention is the best um, thing you can do. Right. And that prevention starts with education. So, um, again, like I said, my daughter is a pre. She's actually a young teacher, not a preteen. But I know when she was a preteen, we went to the pediatrician as we do every year for her physical and stuff to get ready for the summer camps. And um, they always ask the same question. As soon as I get there, it's almost like a routine. They look at her age and they're like, "Okay, let's ask her this. And they just immediately offered Gardasil, uh, which is for HPV prevention. Right. Um. Let's start by talking about HPV and what that is. Sure. Yeah. So HPV is a sexually transmitted virus. It's extremely common. It's a wart virus. And so it can actually, there's about 200 different strains of the virus. Some of them, you know, can cause like warts on your hands or your feet. Um, There's about 40 different strains that can affect the genital tract. Some of those can cause genital warts. Others don't cause any warts at all or nothing that you can see with a visible eye. And those are the ones that are of particular concern because they increase the risk for HPV-related cancers. And so that might be cervical cancer, which I think most of us have heard about. Um, Another that they're finding out that HPV is related to a lot of the different oral and throat cancers. Um, Also, it can cause anal cancer and also penile cancer. So it does put both men and women at risk. And what we found is that we know that we are screening for women um, for cervical cancer through our pap smears. And so there's a certain number of cervical cancers that are diagnosed every year. And then there's also almost an equal number of oral and throat cancers being diagnosed and are men that are related to HPV. And so I find it quite interesting that the oral and throat cancers are being diagnosed almost at the same rate as the cervical cancer. And again, you know, we are screening for the cervical cancer and we're not really screening consistently for the oral and throat cancers. So it's a big problem and it seems like it's growing. That is interesting because, you know, normally when I see or hear about it, it's from a female. 
You know, up until we actually had the vaccine, HPV really wasn't a part of the conversation. Um, you might have heard it in mention in relation to the general rewards, of course, but up until just, you know, in the 70s is when we figured out that HPV was causing cervical cancer. And um, we really haven't had good testing for HPV. Like, let's say, for example, you know, you're, you know, you have a new partner or, you know, your daughter goes and she gets a, you know, a, a boyfriend or girlfriend and, and, you know, you want to do some STD testing to make sure everybody's got a clean bill of health, everything's safe, you know, this kind of thing. They're not testing for HPV. And HPV is our most common sexually transmitted infection. And we do know it causes cancer. So, you know, it can, this can be fatal. So the HPV is not being routinely tested in the STD panels when you go and get like a pelvic exam or a, a what's the other one? So when you get a pap smear, yeah, they yeah. can test for it. Usually they don't test, they don't test for it automatically. When they test for it, it's because your pap smear has to come back as abnormal. And so depending on how they coded your pap smear when they sent it to the lab, you know, if it's they might just automatically check it if the cells are abnormal to look for HPV. And I think the most of them do that, but there are different codes where like, um, if it's a little bit abnormal, they'll test for it. If it's very abnormal, they'll just assume that it's HPV because HPV causes the vast majority of abnormal pap smears. It's like 99%. So that's really been the only way that women have been able to get tested for HPV is through their pap smear. Um, if you're 30 years or older, you can request that your you know, gynecologist or the clinic that's doing your, your pap smear check for HPV, but you have to be very specific because they'll generally just code it you know, if there's a problem. But under Obamacare, the way things are at the moment, it is covered under, you know, the well woman exam if you're 30 years or older to check for HPV, you know, as a standalone test. So good to know. Yes, it is because um, we want to be. Yes, it is because um, we want to be well informed when we go to the doctor, and I hope that everyone is going to the doctor for all of their uh, routine exams. Uh, just because you don't feel something wrong doesn't mean, or something doesn't look right, or if something doesn't feel right, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is okay. So, and HPV in particular, like there's no symptoms um, until your, your pap smear is abnormal. And so that means that it's causing a problem. Now, if you were to go, like, let's say you go to your doctor or to Planned Parenthood or, you know, any, any clinic that does STD testing, and in particular, if you're a man, and you ask for the HPV, you know, to be tested for HPV, they'll tell you, like, if I just went to Planned Parenthood's website, um, like, a month or two ago to look and see, just to make sure, to confirm my information, and they say, you know, on there that there are, that there is no HPV test for men. Now, there is actually an HPV test for men, and this is a new test that is not being offered through mainstream uh, medical channels yet. It hasn't like caught on. And it's largely, I think, because they don't really know what to do with the people who test positive for HPV, unless you have abnormal pap smear, in which case then they know what to do with you. You know, so there is resistance for new, you know, to even test for it. Like, you know, I talked to lots of doctors, I talked to a lot of healthcare providers and you know, there are attitudes like, well, it's such a common virus that, you know, everybody gets it. And so therefore it doesn't matter. We just treat it if there's a problem and that kind of thing. And as somebody who's been diagnosed with HPV twice and has had problems from it, it's like, if I can test for it, I want to know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Let you know the, I mean? let the patient be the one, you know, to decide and, and not be ignorant about it, you know, because right. there's so many STDs and, you know, other kinds of diseases for that matter that could live in your body and you're not even aware of it for a while. And yeah, so, well, and, you know, for example, like me personally, I've had a history of HPV, you know, right now I'm testing positive for it. It's like, I want to know that so I can protect my male partner, you know, from getting an oral infection. You know, it's like, yeah. while I'm testing positive, you know, it's like, if we're going to, 
do oral sex, you know, he needs to like use a dental dam or something like that to protect himself, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, so we can make conscious choices to protect each other within our relationship, you know, based on that information. And so I think it's really great that there is a test available now, you know, it's, it's not offered by the doctors, at least, you know, the majority of it, I can't wait until that changes. But right now, you know, people can order it online. They can, you know, do it in the comfort and privacy of their own home. So now you won't get tagged with a pre-existing condition if you get, um, you know, test positive for HPV, because that could be a concern here in the future. So I'm glad that there's a new option. (laughs) What's the, what's the name of that? um, What's the name of that test, Robin? Um, It's being offered by a company called Self Collect. And I actually, I have links to it on my website. Um, They're offering two different versions of the test. One is just testing for the high risk HPV. So it'll tell you if you have 16 or 18, which are the two that are most likely to cause cancer. And then there's a pool of about a dozen other high risk strains, but it won't like identify like which of those 12 that you have. So they have that test, which is available to the general public. It runs around, you know, $80, $90, that type of thing. So it's not, it's pretty reasonable. And you can test, you know, oral, anal, vaginal, and penile. So again, first time ever we've been able to test men. So I'm very excited about that. Um, And then the other test that they have available is the full genotype testing for HPV. So they're testing 49 different strains of HPV that can affect the genital tract. And because I've had communication with a representative of the lab and, you know, because I'm a holistic healthcare practitioner, she let my boyfriend and I, you know, play around with the test kits and that kind of thing. Um, So we got to, you know, do like oral, anal, um, penile, vaginal collections um and just you know have some fun with the test kits and probably only i would be like and have some fun with the test kits (laughs) 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 it's like a total like geek thing but yeah anyway um so yeah so because i knew that that they had this option when i recently went to their website and I was like, oh, they're not offering that. I was like, why not? And so I, I, I contacted her. I was like, you know, if I have clients who want the full genotype testing, is that something that we could do for them? And she's like, let me go check with the lab. And she went to talk to the powers that be. And she's like, yeah, actually, you know, we can do that. This is how much it'll cost. You know, do you want me to make an order form for you? And I said, hell yeah, sure. That sounds great. (laughs) So so at least right now, um, you know, through me, through my website, people can get the full genotype testing. So, um, you know, there may be other places in the future, but at least right now, I'm the only person who's you know, making that available to, to my community. So if somebody has been having problems with HPV and it's not like 16 or 18, which are the two that, you know, your doctor can test for and identify and want to know like more specific information, like which of like the other high risk ones, or, you know, do you have the low risk ones too, you know, then they can get that access to that test through, through me and my website. That's great. I also want to make that link available um, in the show notes as well. So if you didn't yeah. catch that, because I think that we need to make sure we get the word out about that for that males are included in that testing. Yeah, I think it's such, it's like about time, like OMG, about time. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's one of the things that I noticed when I went to the pediatrician's office for that and saw that Gardasil vaccine being offered is that the posters had girls and boys on that poster. So can you tell me a little bit about that vaccine and why they offer it, you know, at that young age? Yeah. So what they want to do is they want to get kids before they become sexually active and are exposed to the virus. There's three different HPV vaccines. One is used to be offered here in the United States, but they don't anymore. It's used widely elsewhere in the world, and that's protecting against 16 and 18, which are the two that are most likely to um, to cause cancer. And right now in the U.S., Gardasil has the entire vaccine market sewed up. So they have their Gardasil 4, which is 16, 18, and then the two that are most likely to cause genital warts, which are 6 and 11. And then Gardasil 9, which is a little bit newer, so it includes the first four and then five additional of the high-risk strains. And I don't remember off the top of my head which ones they are, but 
You know, the vaccines have their advantages. Vaccines are controversial topics. People feel very strongly about vaccines. You know, I don't necessarily have an opinion either way. My feeling is, is, um, you know, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of the vaccine being a requirement for schools, which I know that some states do have that as a requirement to attend school. So that kind of makes me uncomfortable. I would rather have it be, you know, a parent's choice to do what they feel is right for, you know, their children, for their family. The vaccine doesn't provide total protection against the possible cancer-causing strains of HPV, so you still need to protect yourself. And, you know, condoms also don't provide 100% protection. I mean, what I would kind of love to see is like a combination of like, you know, like let's use the new testing that's available. Let's find out what people have been exposed to. If somebody has been exposed to like say 16 or 18 and, you know, they're entering into a relationship where somebody hasn't been exposed to that, maybe that person might want to go out and get the vaccine, you know, then it becomes their conscious choice to, you know, as a way to protect themselves against, you know, as they come together with this person, you know, who they want to be in relationship with. So, you know, it's a tool. So I don't know. I don't know what the perfect answer is, but. Oh no, you know. we just wanted to give information and <laughs> yeah. how long does that vaccine last? You know, it's a fairly new vaccine. It's been around for, I don't know, 20 plus years or so. And they're saying it, it lasts for at least 20 years and probably longer. So. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you'll need booster shots in the future. Cause I mean, we're, we're, we can get HPV at any age, you know, and we're, we can be sexually active up until we die. So. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Okay. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode. Comment on social media using the handle at Dere Allen or email us at kickingit at dereallen.com. And by the way, kicking it has no G. Treatments for cervical dysplasia, um, you know, they offer like cryotherapy, which is freezing your cervix. They offer something called LEAP, L-E-E-P, which is like a, a hot wire that they use to remove, you know, cells of your cervix. Um, they also offer something called a cone biopsy, which cuts a cone-shaped piece of your cervix. Like it's, it's usually used when abnormal cells are found in the endocervical canal. So that's the passage through your cervix where the baby comes when it's born. So if they're finding abnormal cells in there, they'll cut like a cone-shaped piece out of that to remove that tissue. And so what these procedures can do, the ones that are like physically removing tissue from the cervix, depending on, you know, how deeply they go, you know, how often these procedures are repeated, it can put future fertility at risk because like um actually just came across a woman a woman who her doctor's recommending a hysterectomy because she's had you know repeated procedures and she's still having problems and so their you know their solution is okay let's just remove the uterus so if you were planning on having kids well you're going to be adopting now um some of the other procedures can weaken the structure of the cervix. So as the pregnancy gets heavy, as the baby gets heavy, as you get closer to the term, you know, it can result in premature birth. So sometimes, you know, moms will have to go on bed rest. Sometimes they'll sew the cervix shut to keep the baby in. So hmm. yeah, it's kind of invasive and yeah. kind of scary if you, you know, are planning on having kids um, in the future. And some women, you know, have lasting pain after these procedures. So, you know, mm -hmm. it could be pain with sex. It could be just constant pain. Um, it can be very traumatic for women who've been affected this way. So yes. it's a big deal. It's a big yes. deal. And it's women don't deal. realize, you know, mm -hmm. like how big of a deal it can be, you know, like some women report, you know, difficulty achieving orgasm after these kinds of procedures. So, yeah. So yeah. if there's alternative ways, don't you think we maybe should explore those first? Something a little less invasive? I think that uh, HPV is, is very serious and it's a mistake for people to say, as you mentioned earlier, that, well, you know, everybody gets it. And, you know, a lot of times it'll resolve itself on its own. And sometimes it will, but sometimes it doesn't. And I still think you need to practice 
prevention and be educated about yes. the different options. And so I know that you can recommend some natural solutions that will help the body if you do contract HPV some kind of way or heal. Um, let's say you get an abnormal pap smear, which most of us have at least once in our lives if we're over the age of 18. And so what are some natural things that we can do that are not invasive, like you just mentioned? I feel like HPV likes to take advantage of a weakened system. So in particular, a weakened immune system. So if you're under a lot of stress, if you're not taking care of your body, if you're eating poorly, you know, all these things help to create a situation where if HPV is present, it will be more likely to cause your cervix cells to be abnormal, you know, it's like, or, you know, if you have oral HPV, you know, the, the tissues in your mouth to start developing, you know, a lesion or something like that. And so it's really all about, you know, taking care of yourself, making sure that you're treating your body right, that you're eating good food, that you're getting good sleep, that you're, you know, reducing stress levels. Stress in particular seems like it's a big one. Like a lot of, like I've come across many women who been in you know one relationship you know over a long period of time with no problems no like outside monkey business any of that kind of stuff and you know like for example like go through a divorce or something like that and all of a sudden have an abnormal pap smear and it's because their immune system you know was keeping the virus in check but that big hit you know like going through a divorce or losing a loved one or you know losing your job or something you know like really big and stressful can depress your immune system to the point where the virus is like, oh, look, the immune system is busy elsewhere. Let's have a party. And then mm -hmm. your next pap smear comes back abnormal. And you're like, great. On top of everything else, now my doctor's talking pre-cancer and scaring the crap out of me. So, and it's true. I mean, it is a serious situation and you do need to deal with it. However, there are a lot of things that you can do, you know, to, to help reverse the situation. And you know, if you're a smoker, again, smoking is like double whammy. It's like the nicotine in the cigarette smoke, the chemicals in the cigarette smoke actually like attack your cervix and the chemicals can be, you know, transported in semen. So if you're engaging in unprotected sex with a smoker, you know, his semen is bathing your cervix in toxic chemicals. So not a healthy choice for a cervix that's struggling. Um, no. Birth control pills can be another thing that, you know, increase your risk of having problems. So if you're, you know, using birth control pills or hormonal birth control and are having problems, you know, with your cervix, it may be worth it to explore some natural birth control methods, which I also happen to teach about too. So you know, I have a lot of great resources for women who are, who are dealing with, you know, HPV and an abnormal pap smear. So, Yes, Robin has tons and tons of links that uh, she has provided me, which I will share on the show notes page and also on her website as well. I want her to talk a little bit about what she does all the time. It's like, it's her baby. It's the HPV education project. And she's obviously, you know, as she's done here in the last 20 minutes or so, been raising awareness about HPV. And as she has mentioned, she's had it before. I've had it before as well. And it's something that can be kind of scary when you don't know enough about it because you just think of the word virus or you think of the word disease and you're like, oh my gosh. So... Tell us more about the HPV Education Project. Yeah, so I started the HPV Education Project um, as a way to kind of get information out about the virus in particular, because I don't feel like it's being educated about enough. A lot of people just don't realize that it's not even being tested for when you go, you know, to get STD testing, because, you know, I mean, here you are with a new partner, you're trying to do the right thing, get a clean bill of health, but, you know, they don't tell you that it's not testing for HPV. And unless you don't know, you don't know. And so it's like, here you are, you're thinking you're both good. And the next thing, you know, you happen is you get an abnormal pap smear and you're like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> it's like, how is this even possible? So, you know, so I started it for that reason. And also I wanted to, you know, raise awareness that now we do actually have a test available that we can use to find out if we do carry the virus. You know, if you test positive, it's not the end of the world. 
It's super common. You know, lots of people have it. There is a chance that your body can clear it in a couple years. It's not it's like a short-term infection, but you know, you can, you can take steps. And do we know for sure that your body can clear it? Well, I, when I was first diagnosed with it, you know, back in like the nineties and in 2000, they were saying that it's a virus that you keep for life. These days they're saying, oh, a lot of people actually clear it. And so do we actually know who clears it and who doesn't? We don't really know because we haven't had good testing. And so maybe these testing methods that we now have access to can help answer some of those questions. So, you know, and then also finally, you know, I just also wanted to raise awareness that, you know, there are natural solutions for HPV and cervical dysplasia that do not involve cutting chunks out of your cervix and, you know, this kind of thing. And they seem to work really well. And, you know, if they don't work, you know, then you always have the surgical procedures to fall back on. And so I really feel like, you know, giving women the opportunity to be empowered about their health and, you know, have the opportunity to try to, you know, reverse cervical dysplasia on their own, I think is, is, is excellent. And I think it's a really empowering way to address your health because like I said before, you know, I really feel like cervical dysplasia is a reflection of what is going on in your body, you know, as a whole. And I found that when I've had problems with it, it's, you know, at times where I wasn't taking care of myself or there was a lot of stress, um, you know, that type of thing. And so that's really, and, you know, and then it also ties into, you know, like the whole communication piece, you know, like if you've, you know, if you do test positive for it, or if you have children, you know, who you want to protect, you know, again, education and communication is so important. And I just want to make sure that our young people grow up having this information because, you know, I, I, I look at my life, like my life is like, I'm a, like a page. You just could have ripped my life out of the book of statistics, you know, and it's like, you know, sexually abused, you know, like sex at a young age, you know, STDs, you know, unintended pregnancy, like the whole nine yards. And it's like, if I can educate people and like, be like, Hey, you know, like, don't do what I did. Like, don't learn this stuff the hard way. It's like, then I feel like I've, you know, even if I can save one person from suffering, I feel like I did a good job. So. Well, absolutely. You, I'm sure you have Robin and I appreciate so much your honesty and your openness um, about this subject and your own uh, struggles and, and how you've been so inspired to become like a catalyst and an advocate for this cause. And um, especially for the girls and the kids that are coming up. There are several resources that Robin is offering um, on her various websites where she's addressing these issues of, you know, whether you're a parent that needs to talk to your kids about sex and uh, sexually transmitted diseases or the natural ways to overcome HPV and to protect yourself. So, Robin, I'd like you to share with our audience here how they can get in touch with you, first of all, and anything else you want to share as far as gifts. So um, my websites, as you probably guess, I have a couple of them. The HPV Education Project is uh, hpvedu.com. And my Raising Empowered Daughters project is raisingempowereddaughters.com. And the Natural Birth Control is fertilitydiva.com. And diva is spelled D as in David, E as in Edward, B as in Victor, A as in Apple. So, um, yeah, so, you know, those are my main websites. I'm also on Facebook. I have several, you know, pages and groups and that kind of thing. Um, and also the um, for the cervical health, if um, anybody has, like, um, you know, problems with HPV or an abnormal pap smear, the website for that is cervixhealth.com. And we'll make sure to post all those there. But, you know, that talks about like, you know, what it means if you've had an abnormal pap smear, you know, what the tests are that your doctor's talking about, how to interpret your pap smear, you know, the, the natural solutions. We'll talk a, a little bit about that. And all of my websites also have links to my calendar if you want to like get together and have a conversation about any of these topics schedule permitting i'm always happy to uh, sit down and, and talk to people so just let me know how i can how i can help 
I think this has been a wonderful show and I am very grateful for you sharing this information and starting this conversation, getting people to think about their health and speaking up for getting answers that they need, tests that might need to be to happen, saying no to tests that they don't want to happen and talking to their children and talking to their partners. That's really important. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we need the, the medical establishment for, you know, diagnostics, you know, um, you know, they have great resources, but they don't have all the answers. And so, you know, if you're faced with any kind of reproductive health challenge, you know, look around, see what's out there, find out what your options are and go in educated and whatever choice you make is perfect you know just make sure that it's an educated choice and make sure it's right for you yes and also know that you're not alone there's like thousands and million of women that are dealing with all these issues as well so don't feel embarrassed like oh i can't even say this or you know what will they think of me don't worry about any of that stuff your life is too important yeah i mean really it's we're all in this boat together. It's like, you're not alone. It's like, we all are dealing with this stuff. You know, HPV is a huge problem. You know, the challenges talking to your kids about sex, you know, it's like, get yeah. support, you know, like practice with your adult friends, you know, <laughs> whatever you need to do to make it, you know, a comfortable conversation. I mean, think about when you talk to your, about sex with your girlfriends, there's a lot of giggling. It's fun. You know, it's like, Sex is fun to talk about. We just need to get over that that piece where it's awkward, you know, to talk to your kids about sex because we can all have a sense of humor about it. We need to lighten up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Because that's how they got here. So (laughs) (laughs) well, Robin, thank you again for joining us on Kicking It with Doree. And um, again, you can you can come back anytime and and share some more insights with us on the things you're working on and your findings and anything that will help us uh, continue to, you know, be informed. Sure, I would love to.
If you like this show, I'd love to have your support. Visit patreon.com forward slash kicking it with Doree without the G to learn more.